Hi, uh, so I'm Jeff Johnson. I'm a philosophy professor at a local uh, college here, St. Uh, Catherine University in St. Paul. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about so, uh, some, some a project I'm working on that sort of arose out of my uh, both doing philosophy and thinking about animal ethics issues, thinking about the ethics of eating animals, uh, but also doing volunteer work and outreach with a local animal advocacy group. So, uh, you know, I, I originally dove in thinking, hey, this is going to be great. I can use all my philosophical argumentative skills uh, to and put them to good use in trying to advocate for uh, farmed animals um, on the ground. And uh, this project, I think, arose out of a kind of uh, puzzling uh, inadequacy that I found in my <clears throat> command of arguments. And so uh, you know, people didn't seem to respond to them in the way that I hoped they would, uh, in the way that philosophers tend to. Um, and it actually led me to uh, well, sort of help solidify some worries that I had about philosophical uh, thinking about ethics um, more generally. So I'll try to say a little something about that. Uh, so uh, when you talk to people about factory farming, you know, and you let them know, uh, so here I'll put a picture up of a, of a gestation stall. This was captured by uh, Mercy for Animals last summer here in Minnesota uh, at Christensen Farm. So this is local food, right? <coughs> when you talk to people about factory farming, you show them what it's like uh, for the animals on these huge industrial farms. You know, they're broadly sympathetic with worries about confinement, with worries about uh, forced pregnancy, separation of the young from their moms, uh, worries about various kinds of mutilations and so on. Um, and often I find, and these are not academics, right? I find that they're that they start sort of thinking about the prospect of withdrawing uh, support from these kinds of uh, systems. And of course, in my advocacy with with compassionate action for animals, what I try to encourage them to do is to eat you know more plant-based foods, to uh, try uh, vegetarianism or veganism as an option. Uh, but of course, that's viewed as uh, too radical, or it's sometimes viewed as too radical, right? This seems uh, this seems extreme especially in view of the fact that there are alternatives to eating factory farmed animals uh, that seem better, right? Alternatives that you, you feel like you might be able to take some moral cover under. Uh, so they often talk to me about, uh, about their, their inclination to start, seek out and try to find uh, food uh, that comes from animals that have been raised humanely and killed humanely. Uh, so the next image I'll show you, this is from a pig farm that I visited last uh, May, so May 2012, uh, down in southern Minnesota. Uh, it was sort of a fluke. I was uh, at my CSA at lunch, and across the table from me were some farmers who worked for Nyman Ranch. You know, this is a sort of celebrated, humane outfit. Um, and I asked that, you know, I was asking them all kinds of questions about how the animals are raised, and they were very obliging. And I said, hey, can I check, can I see the animals? And <laughs> astoundingly, they said, they didn't know that I had an interest in animal advocacy on uh, this sort of thing. Astoundingly, they said, yeah, you know, we're not going to be there, but go on up, you know, take the first left after you get off the road, you'll see a little red barn, uh, drive down there, see some dogs out front, walk around the barn, you'll see the pigs. You know, so I went, and nobody was there but me, and the dogs, and the pigs, and uh, here's what I saw. So here is where the, uh, this is a sow uh, on their farm. Um, you know, last night at the, at the plenary, uh, Joey Tuminello has a connection with Farm Forward. Uh, said something that I can't help but but uh, but repeat here that uh, even though I'm not inclined to see this as a, a kind of happy situation in view of what we know will ultimately happen to this animal, uh, I don't have any doubt that it's uh, that it's not better than what we saw before. Right. Uh, so there's so I want to say that. Um, so people have something like this in mind, as I understand it. Just talking to uh, I had a conversation uh, some time ago with the. Uh, executive director of the Minnesota Pork Producers Association, and his inclination uh, was to think, and other folks that I talked to, his inclination was to think that this is pretty rare, and that, that the animals, you know, the, the pigs who are raised humanely in the state are often still raised inside, and so the idea that the animals live outside is, is really sort of an exception. Um, but the, uh, but in any case, I guess this is the kind of system of production that people are thinking about uh, in general when they think that, they're, that these humane options give them some kind of more color. So I want to start by saying a little something about what philosophers are inclined to think in response to this, uh, this question about eating humanely raised and humanely killed animals. Um, so on the pro side, philosophers who are of philosophers who would argue that eating humanely raised and humanely killed animals is okay, is something like Roger <coughs> Uh, so Scruton is inclined to think that eating animals is not a problem, 
I mean, the, the fact that we have to kill them even from is not a problem, uh, because he's sort of broadly on board with the idea uh, that they don't have any uh, rights, and in particular, crucially, they don't have the right to that. Um, so when we take their life, even if, if it's to serve you know, something that's a kind of selfish purpose of our own, uh, um, it's not any kind of serious moral violation. Now, the reason they don't have rights is the sort of standard reason. They don't have autonomy, right? they can't deliberate, they don't engage with moral concepts, they can't negotiate the world in a way that's sort of reflective of, of, a, of an interest in doing the right thing, so on. Um, but Scruton is not inclined to think that uh, factory farming is okay. Uh, it's sort of hard, I mean, one of the things that he says that leads him to say that, uh, that other animals don't have rights is that they don't belong to the moral community, right? Because they don't have these characteristics, they don't belong to the moral community, and you have to be a member of that community in order to have rights. But even though they don't belong to the moral community, according to uh, Scruton, um, nevertheless, we have a duty to them. Very weird. As far as I can tell, the idea is that we get something out of the relationship that we, uh, we, we find ourselves in with them when we farm. Right? What we get is you know, meat, milk, eggs, whatever. And so the idea is that that relationship gives rise for Scruton to what he calls a duty of care. Right? So in our, engagement, in our engagement with them, we have to treat them uh, with some care. And so for him, this rules out factory farming and, uh, and makes him squarely a proponent of, uh, of, of small-scale farming and the kind that we saw before. Now those on the other side, people who are inclined to indict uh, even humanely raised and humanely killed animals, of course, we know some of the common views. Uh, Regan's view, for example, is that animals have a right to life. Uh, in virtue of being subjects of a life, they have a life that they care about, that they can care about, and so for us to take it as a problem. Um, Jeff McMahon gives an interesting uh, argument. Uh, he says that no matter how an animal is raised, he has a nice paper called Eating Animals the Nice Way. I encourage you to have a look uh, if, you're, if you're inclined. Uh, he's at a Foster at Rutgers. Um, but he, uh, he, he argues this way. He says, um, Look, the problem with these small-scale or humanely raised operations is that, uh, is that even if we treat the animals well during their lives, still we deprive them of you know, substantial portions of their life, years and years of their life. Um, and his inclination is to think that this, this deprivation is sort of fundamentally uh, problematic. And the way that he tries to give voice to that is to say that uh, that is sort of a nice move. He says, you know, there's no question that animals enjoy eating, right? Other animals enjoy eating just as much as we do. And when we kill them while they're young, in order to make a meal out of them, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a few meals at the cost of depriving them of tons and tons of meals, right? So it's, there's a, a clear sort of uh, uh, way in which the benefits we get are not, uh, don't outweigh the harms that we, that we cause. Um, other philosophers, um, Brusalski, for example, will argue that, that you know, on these small scale farms, there's still harms to the animals. And uh, those harms uh, surely outweigh whatever harms we incur by deciding to eat, you know, a veggie burger instead of a instead of a hamburger. So maybe I don't like the taste that much. Right? Maybe I like the taste of a hamburger better. But you know that the, the sort of badness that that I uh, I take on in eating the the uh, veggie burger is not so bad as to as to outweigh the harms. Uh, in any case, those are the sort of standard philosophical lines, or some of them at least. And um, I see some issue with them, and in, in particular when I try to do uh, outreach and advocacy. Um, one problem I see is a problem that's flagged by uh, Cora Diamond in a paper that she wrote uh, in response to Kudzi's book, The Lives of Animals. She worries that uh, engaging in philosophical argument can, can encourage what she calls uh, deflection. It's a concept that she borrows from Stanley Cavell. But the idea, I guess, fundamentally is that, uh, is that you know, there's a way of sort of in, thinking about what we're doing, bringing these animals into existence just to kill them for our own uh, sort of pleasure, that's really sort of hard to get your head around. And, uh, and one thing to do in response to that, to sort of avoid having to come to terms with that, is to retreat into sort of abstract moral theory, cooking up counterexamples, right, cooking up new theories, cooking up little nuances on theories, and so on. So Diamond uh, characterizes deflection broadly in this way. I'll let you read it. <coughs> She gives an example of it. This is later in the paper. This is uh, the difficulty of reality and the difficulty of philosophy. Um, later in the paper, she characterizes the uh, the kind of difficulty of reality that might cause us to the 